Shalom on the Sabbath day. Welcome to the Philadelphia Assemblies. Today is the 19th day of the third month of the year 5782 on the set apart calendar. And it's the fourth day of June or the sixth month 2022 on the Gregorian calendar. And it's the seventh day Sabbath or Saturday as it would be known in English, which we know is not talking about a, the set apart day, but still the, the rotation of the days of the week. As far as all the you know uh, research that I've been able to do has not changed as long as they've been keeping records. Okay, so a lot of people say that you know they ought to start the Sabbath day on the first uh, seven days after the new moon whenever you keep the new moon, which I completely disagree with. I don't think there's any real scripture. I think only things out of context uh, are used to uh, make the, support that opinion, okay? That, and, of course, that's my opinion, okay? But, again, today is the seventh day Sabbath, and it's the fourth day of June, and it's the 19th day of the third month of the year 5782 on Yahuwah's set-apart calendar. Today... I'm going to be continuing my expository teaching. Have had a little sabbatical or took a little break uh, from doing those, not because I was taking a break, but because I was just doing a lot of other things. Uh, Brother Eric Burkholz, uh now here as co-pastor or co-teacher here at the uh, Philadelphia Assemblies, and I have been working on the inside of the assembly hall, okay? We've been working and restoring pews and doing all kinds of things to get this ready to bring in a, a, a larger congregation, okay? So that's what we've been doing. That's why you haven't seen me as often on the internet and on Facebook as far as teaching. And so we're gonna, I'm going to try to get back to that even if I have to just do it early on the Sabbath before we do our regular message at 1 p.m. Uh, PM, which we will be doing today at 1 p.m., and we'll have it up on the internet later today as well. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and start in part four of the book of Ecclesi Ecclesiasticus, okay, or Yeshua, I'm, I'm sorry, or, or Yehusha, son of Sirach, part four. And I did look at this name a little deeper and I do agree that it's just like our Messiah's name. It's not a de derivation of that name. It's exactly like Messiah's name. Obviously this is not talking about Sarai, uh, about the Messiah. This is talking about Yahushua, son of Sirach. Okay? And so this is the Ecclesiasticus or the wisdom. Okay? So it would be another way to putting that. This is this book is not a lot different than the book of Ecclesiastes or Proverbs. Okay, so, and I think you'll notice that as I continue this part four. And we're going to start again in chapter 25, and we're going to run for about an hour or till around a quarter after 10, is, or a quarter after 11 is now, and it's about 20 after 11. I'm going to shoot for that, try to end it at a chapter break. But before we get started, I'm going to stand and face. Jerusalem, the place where the Father has chose to place his name there and open in prayer. If I can get up. <clears throat> Almighty Father Yahuwah, again we praise you in all things. Father, we praise you for this day, this seventh day Sabbath that you set apart and sanctified from the foundations of the world and Father have preserved through your people all these years. Father, I ask that you would uh, anoint each and every one of us, Father, that's either here today or that is listening to this message later on YouTube and Facebook, that you, Father, would anoint us all and give us more understanding. Father, I ask that you would give me the proper words to say, and they be your words and not mine. And again, we pray for the sick to be healed. We pray for those that lost loved ones to have that peace that passes understanding through your Ruach HaKadosh, our Holy Spirit. And we ask, Father, uh, that you would uh, keep that hedge of protection around your believers. And again, we ask all these things in your precious Son, Yahushua, or Jesus' name. Amen. 
<clears throat> oh, yeah, I want to. Before I begin here, I want to uh, make a, I guess, a little disclaimer. You know, we say Yahusha, okay, for the Messiah's name, but we know many out there, as was myself, just, you know, maybe 15 years ago, was calling on the name of Jesus, okay? And I want to make sure that no one feels that we are thinking that they don't have salvation based on how you pronounce the name. We're going to continue to proclaim that even though I use Yahuwah and Yahusha and even talk about other Hebrew words. Salvation is not found in the pronunciation of a name. Matter of fact, our Messiah says he will have a new name when he comes the next time. So we're just doing our best to have proper understanding and as we call on the name, the best we know how, okay? And everyone else has to do as they are so convicted and, and, and do that by faith, okay? So if you say Yeshua and you're doing that by faith, praise yeah. the Father, you, you're, you're doing that by faith. If you say Yahushua and you, and you feel that's correct, Praise God. We do it by faith. If you say Yahusha or you say Jesus, everyone in their own understanding and time. I do believe there's importance in how we pronounce the name, but salvation is found through our Messiah's death, resurrection, and our picking up His life. And that is keeping His Torah because that's what He did. And that's what we believe here at the Philadelphia Assembly. So hopefully that little disclaimer... We're going to do that every once in a while just to make sure people don't think that we're thinking salvation is, you know, in somehow how we pronounce the name. Again, we'll go ahead and get started now. Uh, chapter 25 of the book of Ecclesiasticus. Again, Yahushua, son of Sirach. Chapter 25, verse 1. My soul or my life, my personal being takes no pleasure takes pleasure, not doesn't take no pleasure, my being takes pleasure in three things, okay? And they are beautiful in the sight of Yahuwah and of men. Agreement between brothers. Now we know there's definitely lots of scripture to support that, you know, how pleasant one of them is, how pleasant it is for brothers to walk together, okay, and, and understanding, and that's what we have to do. It also says friendship between neighbors. So all this idea of shunning people because they aren't keeping the law is foolishness. You know, that's foolishness. They, keep, they might be keeping the law better than you and you just don't understand the true meaning of the law. And they may not, but it's still not our, we still says we should have friendship between our neighbors and a wife and a husband who live in harmony. That's one of those three things, okay, that, that Sirach uh, or Yahushua the son of Sirach is proclaiming. And this is not anything different than you'd be reading in Ecclesiasticus or in Proverbs, Ecclesiastes or Proverbs. It's, it's a great thing for a husband and wife to live in harmony. And the opposite of that, he's getting ready to bring up here in verse 2. He says, My soul or, or my life, myself, my being, hate these three kinds of men. Okay? Now we're talking about the men. He says, I am greatly offended at their life. Okay? Why? Because he, he's read all these things. He understands the word of Yahuwah. He says, a beggar who is proud. A beggar is too proud to ask for help. That's what it's talking about. We've got to read the scripture. When we're down, we've got to be able to ask for help and not be too proud to, you know, to be lifted up. And, so, and a rich man who is a liar. Okay? And not all rich men are liars, but a lot of them are. They'd tell you anything, whatever you want to hear, just to get you to enrich them, okay? An adulterous old man who lacks good sense. Now, if you get to be an old man and you're still an adulterer, you lack good sense, okay? Because the scripture flat tells us we cannot be doing that. And usually people that are like that, they don't have any sense. You can see by the way they walk. They get to be an old man. Verse 3. You have gathered nothing in your youth. Talk about this old man that has no sense. He's gathered nothing in his youth, so he hasn't learned a thing from his mistakes. How then can you find anything in your old age? Question. In other words, how are you going to gain any wisdom in your old age if you didn't learn anything 
from the mistakes you made when you were a child. Verse 4, what an attractive thing is judgment in a gray-haired man. That means somebody that has learned something in their life, and you can tell by their walk, not only by what they say, that, you know, that they have good judgment. And for, you, and for the aged to possess good counsel, okay, what does that mean? Well, it means that someone that is able to counsel others because of his good judgment. Because you don't want to be judged by, you don't want to be counseled by a fool, even if he is old, okay? Because they are foolish old men, as we can read. Verse 5, how attractive is wisdom in the aged? You know, how, how wonderful is it to meet someone that's older that's really full of not just knowledge, but wisdom? That's what, that's what the Yahushua is saying here, the, the son of Sirach. And understanding and counsel and counsel in honorable men. Even some people that don't understand the Torah and are not keeping the commandments, you could tell that they're honorable men. Okay, you need to be not read too much in either. Verse six, rich in and this is not talking about rich in money. It says rich in experience is the crown of the aged. In other words, someone that has lived a full life and learn from his mistakes, and you could see it in their walk, okay? And he says, and their boast is in the fear of Yahuwah. That's what caps it all off, because without the fear of the Most High, all that other stuff's nothing, really, when it comes down to it. Verse 7, with nine thoughts I have gladdened my heart. Nine things that he's thought upon that's gladdened his heart, and a tenth I will tell with my tongue. Okay. He's going to recite them to you. A man rejoicing in his children. So if, if you raised your children well, that doesn't mean they're going to be walking perfectly, but you've, you've done all you could and they've turned out to be good human beings. You should be able to be rejoicing in your children in your old age. A man who lives to see the downfall of his foes. It says, and he's not talking about any kind of revenge. He says it just gladdens his heart to see that somebody that has been downtrodden outlives those that you know have stood against him throughout all of his life. Verse 8, happy is he who lives with an intelligent wife. And that's the truth. To live with a fool is very difficult for anybody. And there's a lot of foolish women, but there's a lot of foolish men as we just read. This is not singling out women any more than men. And it says, And he who has not made a slip with his tongue. We're talking about somebody that goes out and thinks before he speaks. Okay, how many people you, you know you've talked to, they just let it fly. And then it, they end up offending everybody around them. You know, you, you really need to not make those kind of slips. you got to bridle that tongue. That's what he's talking about. He says that's one thing that makes him happy is to be around somebody that doesn't just let it fly and insult everybody. And he who has not served a man inferior to himself. Let me tell you something. That makes his heart glad. Okay, If you're serving someone that's inferior to yourself, in other words, you work under a boss and you can see all his errors, it ain't going to do nothing but kill you over time. Okay? It, it's very difficult to work for somebody. And it's not talking about inferior is better than. It's talking about someone that has no good sense and is doing things. And, and this makes his light heart jive. He who has not served a man inferior to himself. Happy is he who has gained good sense. Everybody, you know. And to work under somebody when you have good sense and you don't feel that they do, that's not very, that won't make your heart glad. And he who speaks to attentive listeners. See, and that, you know, especially a teacher of the word of Elohim, when you, stand, you constantly teach before people that do not have ears to hear, that is a grievous thing for a teacher, okay? But to be able to speak before an audience like this talks here, this will make you happy who speaks to attentive, people who has ears to hear, okay, listeners. Verse 10, how great is he who gains wisdom? Or you could put understanding there. 
but there is no one superior to him who fears Yahuwah. No matter how much you know, it's all about fearing the Most High. And fearing Him is also to revere Him or respect Him and keep His commandments. Okay? Verse 11, The fear of Yahuwah surpasses everything. All the other wisdom and understanding that you might have, if you don't have that fear and that reverence of Yahuwah, you're, you're, you're behind someone that does. Okay? As far as understanding. <coughs> Excuse me. To whom will be likened, in other words, this one that has that great fear of Yahuwah will be likened or compared to the one who holds it fast. See, the book of Revelation says hold on firmly or fast to the end. See, and that's what that's the same thing he's saying here. The, the writer here is, is to holding on to your salvation and holding on to what you have fast. One that fears Yahuwah is the one that does that. Verse 13, any wound, but not a wound of the heart. Okay, You can be wounded in your body all over in the battlefield and you'll probably survive unless it's between the eyes or in the heart. You can recover. And it's the same thing when you get hit in the heart when you're... Uh, a teacher of the word. Some people end up being grieved by that so much they walk away. Okay? And that's kind of what the author is talking about. He says, any wound, but not a wound of the heart. And he's got its exclamation point. That's trying to, let me have any wound to my body, but don't let it be a wound to my heart. Any wickedness, but not the man of a, uh, but uh, any wickedness, but not the wickedness of a wife. And this agrees with Proverbs. You know, it, it is a terrible thing to have to live with a wife, you know, that's contra contrary. You know, that's probably the best word I could use. Any attack. In other words, give him. So, uh, Yahusha here is saying, give me any attack, but not an attack from those who hate. Okay? So people can come at you, but if they hate you, they're ready to kill you. Okay? He said, don't give me that attack from the person that hates me. And any vengeance, but not the vengeance of my enemies. In other words, protect me from my enemies. There is no venom worse than the snake's venom, and no wrath worse than the enemy's wrath. Okay? If someone teach, considers you an enemy, you better keep that person pretty close and keep your eye on him because he'll, he'll take you out. Verse 16, I would rather dwell with a lion and a dragon. Okay? And then dwell with an evil wife because they're right next to you and they can take you out. Verse 17, the wickedness of a wife changes her appearance. I know I, I, I know everybody has hate or angry, anger and hate. Everybody has it. I remember my mom would give me that look. That's all I needed. If I saw that look, I knew it was time to change my behavior or else I was going to be in big trouble. So he says, Wick, the wickedness of a wife changes her appearance. When she's very uh, mad, you can see your wife change the appearance and darkens her face that like that of a bear. Okay? It says, her husband takes his meals among the neighbors. If you've if you got a wife that's really hateful and scornful to you, what are you going to do? You're going to take your meals with the neighbors. You're not going to hang around home. Okay? And he cannot help sighing bitterly. Any iniquity or lawlessness is insignificant compared to a wife's lawlessness. May a sinner's lot befall her. A wicked wife. That's not talking about all wives. That's one that acts wickedly, that hates her own life and everything that goes on in it. A sandy ascent for, her, for the feet of the aged, such as a glorious wife, and that's not a good word there. I'm not pronouncing that. It's like a proud wife for a quiet husband. That's what that's talking about. A proud wife for a, a, a quiet husband. Have you ever seen someone that, you know, was afraid to speak? You know, when he was around his wife, she did all his talking. He's in control. Uh, she's in control. She basically spiritually runs the show. Okay? That is what he's talking about. It says, do not be entrapped by a woman's beauty. In other words, don't marry somebody because they're attractive, you know, sexually to you, okay? 
Don't do that. And do not desire a woman for her possessions. Don't marry for money. Same goes for men too. Women as well as men shouldn't do that. 22. There is anger and impudence and great disgrace when a wife supports her husband. When, when a wife supports her husband. Okay. What he's talking about is lowliness of, uh, of her attitude. She's uh, humble, not angry. He says, there is wrath and impudence and great disgrace when a wife supports her husband. Actually, I'm going to rephrase that. I, I read that earlier. I should have knew what that was talking about. That's talking about when a husband's lazy and he sits home and lets a wife do it, take care of him. You've heard songs written about that before where uh, you know, get a uh, what's that one song? He says, "Don't wear it, marry yourself an ugly wife or something like that, and she'll take care of you the rest of your life." Okay, and this that's not a good thing. A man should be the head of the household. He says there is anger and impudence and great disgrace when a wife supports her husband. Okay, that means she's doing it all and he's just following her. Okay, a dejected mind, a gloomy face. And a wounded heart are caused by an evil wife. Okay? Not somebody that gets mad occasionally, but an evil wife. Drooping hands. This is describing the man. Drooping hands and weak knees are caused by the wife who does not make her husband happy. Okay? And it does, because they're going to be dejected. They're going to be turned away. If their wife is not happy with them, they're not happy with themselves, that, that husband's going to look like that droopy hands, weak knees are caused by a wife who does not make her husband happy. Verse 24, from a woman, sin had its beginning. This is going back to Eve, okay? And because of her, we all die. Now, I would kind of disagree with that because Adam uh, submitted to her, okay, and ate of the fruit, we all die, but she was the one that was tricked, okay? Allow no outlet to water and no boldness of speech in an evil wife. In other words, some woman that's of wicked intent, do not give her authority. That's what that's talking about in your household. If she does not go as you direct, okay? And I think a, a, a man's also a fool if he doesn't listen to wise counsel from his wife when she gives him wise counsel, Okay? But the opposite is true too. If your if your wife's not doing according to what you think the Torah is directing, then you have to take charge. Okay, that's what it says. That's why if she does not go as you direct. Now, if you're directing her contrary to the word of Elohim or the Torah, then that's another pr problem. But if you're doing that, he says, separate from her from your separate her from yourself. Okay. He's telling you, don't live with the, an evil woman that is not doing as you direct her, as the scripture says. I want to put that in there. Okay? Obviously, you got to be fearing Yahuwah. He's done went over that a lot. Not a husband that is a tyrant and that treats his wife poorly. Verse 26. Happy is the, uh, chapter 26. Happy is the husband of a good wife. And that's absolutely true. Nothing else matters if you and your wife are walking as one. You'll be happy in any circumstance. And that's what the writer is saying here. Okay, The number of his days will be doubled. And even if they're not, they're going to be doubly good. Okay, They can be just as bad, but they'll be doubly good if you're walking with a good wife. Verse 2, a loyal wife rejoices her husband. Now what's that mean? That means your wife, if you you don't have to be around or anything, if somebody starts talking down about her husband, she's going to spring to his defense and like a tiger. You can just count on it. They all will do it if you have a good wife. And he will complete his years in peace. See? And what better of an ending could you have in life to complete your years in peace? A good wife is a great blessing. Excuse me. Sometimes hard. She will be granted among the blessings of the man who fears Yahuwah. 
Here, here's, see, it doesn't matter what state you live in in your life. He, and, and that's what he's trying to uh, talk about right here. He says, whether rich or poor, his heart will be glad. His heart is glad. And at all times his face is cheerful. Or at least most of the time, everybody has their moments, but if, if, you're, if you're with a good wife, you'll be happy. Verse 5, of three things my heart is afraid. So Yahushua, son of Siraj, is telling you here that there's three things he's afraid of. And a fourth, I am frightened, the slander of a city, the gathering of a mob. Boy, we live in these kind of times right now. That's what I see every day. I watch the news, and, 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 it, and it frightens me as well. Not individually for my life, but for, for the people. You know, that, ha that are living through these difficult times. But remember, these times have been going on even back in Yahushua, son of Sirach, or he wouldn't be able to speak of them in this manner. And he says, and a false accusation, because somebody accuses you falsely, you have to defend yourself, and sometimes you don't win. All these are worse than death. There is grief of heart and sorrow when a wife is envious of a rival and a tongue lashing makes it known to all. <laughs> and that will happen whether you're talking about a wife or anyone. An evil wife is an ox yoke with chaves, or in other words, you're locked in with an evil wife. Taking hold of her is like grasping a scorpion. Because no matter what you say or do, she's going to bite you or sting you. That's what, that's what it's saying there, okay? Verse 8, there is great anger when a wife, when a wife is drunken. And, and that's not talking about somebody that takes a drink. That's somebody that's drunken. She will not hide her shame. None of us will hide anything when we, that, you know, the alcohol loosens lips. That's why it's talking about this. A wife's harlotry shows in her lustful eyes. If a wife is lustful, you, uh, the husband will see it. And she is known by her eyelids. In other words, the fluttering of the eyes. Verse 10. Keep strict watch over a headstrong daughter. I'm thankful I didn't have one of those. My daughter was not like that when she was coming up. You know, she really wasn't. And it says, a headstrong daughter, lest when she finds liberty, in other words, she gets away from you, she use it to hurt to her own hurt. Doesn't have own there, but that's what that's talking about her. You ever watch, a lot of times people, a lot of times ministers especially, they'll raise up their children really strictly and keep them right to the deal. And the minute they get out of that house and under that father's foot, they end up destroying their own lives. That's what's being said there. And we, it, it's a fine line that you walk when you're raising children. You, and you should raise them according to the Torah. Problem is we don't all have the Torah when we're raising children. Okay. Be on guard against her impudent, or her imp, imp, impudent yes, I. In other words, she's not really listening to what you say and it's not showing up in what she does. Impudent means the, pop, the, the inability to perform. Okay, so if you look in, into your daughter's eye and, and, and she looks like she's not really hearing you, she's just, you know, telling you what you want to hear. Okay, so be on guard against her impudent eye and do not wonder, wonder if her sins against you. Verse 12, as a thirsty wayfarer, someone that's traveling, opens his mouth and drinks from any water near him, so will she sit in front of every post and open her quiver to the arrow. We all know, we, we can read between the lines what that's talking about. That's what happens to that, the daughters that are not really listening. And might be because you're not showing the proper example. Okay, that's what he's trying to tell you all this. 13, a wife charm delights her husband. And her skill puts fat on his bones. <laughs> Feeding him, I guess, the skill that puts fat on his bones. A silent wife is a gift of Yahuwah. And there is nothing so precious as a disciplined individual or soul. 
A modest wife adds charm to charm, and no balance can weigh the value of a chaste or a, a, a individual that's got herself under control, male or female. And then, it's, and then it says, A modest wife adds charm to charm, and no balance can weigh the value of a, a, a controlled individual. Verse 16, like the sun rising in the heights of Yahuwah. That's what a, a good, beautiful wife that's beautiful on the inside. So is, is the beauty of a good wife in her well-ordered home. Okay, And that's why it says a man shouldn't be a teacher in 1 Timothy if he doesn't have his own house in order. If you can't keep your own house in order, how are you going to keep the order of the house of Yahuwah? See? And that's what this is all talking about, just a different speaker. Verse 17 says, Like the shining lamp on the set-apart lampstead. Now we know what the lampstead is in Revelation. That's the church. Okay, That's the ecclesia, the, uh, the, the set-apart ones. So is a beautiful face on a stately figure. Verse 18. Like pillars of gold on a base of silver, so are beautiful feet with a steadfast heart. See, no matter how good it is on the outside, if they don't have that steadfast heart, they're not loyal, that of that stuff matters. Verse 28. At two things my heart is grieved, and because of a third, anger comes over me. A warrior in want through poverty, and an intelligent man who are treated contemptuously. Now, what did he say there? He says there's two things that grieve his heart. And these are the two things that grieve his heart. A warrior that is, in other words, you could tell he's got a warrior spirit, not that he's a military man, in want through poverty. Because he's going to do, he, he's a warrior, he's a fighter, he's going to get it any way he can get it. And that, that right there grieves him. And an intelligent man who are treated contemptuously. Because an intelligent man is not going to, Stand for someone to treat him, treat him contemptuously. A man who turns back from righteousness to sin. That, that was the last one, and that's the one that angered him. Okay? To sin. Yahuwah will prepare <coughs> him for the sword, or the fire, in the end. 29. A merchant can hardly keep from wrongdoing. So that means a salesman, or someone that sells goods for a living can hardly keep himself from wrongdoing, and a tradesman will not be declared innocent of sin. And he, that's just tell, that's saying overall. Okay, First 20, Chapter 27. Many have committed sin for a trifle. In other words, for nothing. That real, for something that didn't amount to anything. And whoever seeks to get rich will avert his eyes. What's he averting his eyes from? Off of Yahuwah onto whatever he want his desire is. See, that's why we can't be driven by the flesh. As a stake is driven firmly into <coughs> fissure into the crack or fissure between stones, so sin is wedged in between selling and buying. Or in other words, make get selling and making gain. That's what the Babylonian system is all about. That's what Mystery Babylon is all about. And that's what he's saying without saying it. If a man is not steadfast and zealous in the fear of Yahuwah, his house or his family will be quickly overthrown. So, again, that's why 1 Timothy says, if a man doesn't have his own household in order, how can he lead the church of, El or church of Elohim? Verse 4. When a, when, a, when a sieve is shaken, the refuse reminds, or a sieve, okay, I pronounced that wrong. When you put gold in a sieve and you shake it, everything goes out but the gold, okay? And he says, when a sieve is shaken, the refuge means, in other words, the liquid's out, then the refuge remains. So a man's filth remains in his thoughts. Okay? That's why you got to take every, every thought captive. Okay? And got to be according to the Word of God. The kiln, or that's, that's a, an oven, tests the potter's vessels. So this is a, a, an allegory he's speaking here. He's talking about 
The Father's the potter, okay? And He makes us in whatever way He will. And then you're put here on earth. That's the kiln, okay? So understand what's being... The kiln tests the potter's vessels. So the test of a man is in his reasoning, okay? And you get here on earth and you get tested and tempted by all these things that are going around, your reasoning is going to hit the top, okay? And that's what's going to take you either closer to Yahuwah or destroy you. Six, the fruit discloses the culti cultivation of a tree. So the expression of a thought discloses the culti cultivation of a man's mind. So you can sit and listen to somebody and you can tell by the way they talk and the things they talk about what kind of man you're talking with. That's spiritual discernment. If you sit and, you know, with a man, you listen and, and, and filthy thoughts, things like that's coming out of his mind, you're already, you already know where this guy's at because that's where his mind and his heart is and that's what that was talking about here. Again, the, the, the fruit that comes from a tree discloses or uncovers the cultivation of that tree. Okay, what that tree is all about. Okay, so the expression, in other words, what you speak of a thought discloses the cultivation of a man's mind. Okay, and that all goes with spiritual discernment. You have to understand that. Verse 7, do not praise a man before you hear him reason. Okay? You get a man and you start talking to him. I don't care if it's about business or what. In a few minutes, I can discern that guy. Where, he, where he's at and whether or not I can really trust him. Okay, Because he's going to let you know. One thing he'll do is undermine everybody else to and build himself up. What's the scripture say about that? If a guy builds up himself and builds everybody else down, that guy's a phony. Okay, Because if you do right, other people will lift you up. Okay? For this is the test of man. Verse 8. If you pursue justice, you will attain it. So if you seek real justice, you'll attain it. Okay? And wear it as a glorious robe. Birds flock with their kind. This is where my, I guess my mother got the saying, birds of a feather flock together. I don't know if she read this, but this kind of gets passed down by word of mouth. Listen to what it says. Birds flock with their kind. So truth returns to those who, what? Practice it. Now, we don't always do what's right, but if we practice what's right, we're going to do it more and more and more. That's how the Torah takes over our character. So birds of a feather flock together. A lion lies in wait for its prey. So does sin for the workers of iniquity. See, if you don't care about what's right or wrong, you're going to seek those things that are wrong. People love to sin. The flesh is just primed for that. Verse 11, the talk of, godly, of, of, a, of the godly man is always wise. He's on point. He's not making foolish gestures and, and f foolish jokes constantly. You'll be able to tell. Okay? Where was I? The talk of the godly man is always wise. Okay, so in other words, he's going to be on point all the time. But the fool changes like the moon from one thing to the other. Okay, verse 12. Among stupid people, watch for the chance to leave. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you do that, but I do. If I'm around somebody that is talking foolishness, I can't wait to get away from there. It, it aggravates me. It, it, it puts me on edge when someone's saying foolishness, you know, that just don't make, it does not make good sense. But among thoughtful people, stay on. When you get with people that are really thinking about what's right and wrong, hang with those, stay with those people. Stay on, okay? Verse 13, the talk of fools is offensive. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> You know, if somebody, you know, comes around you and their, their, their language is offensive, uh, offensive to you, then you need to get away from those people. And their laughter is wantonly sinful. You, know, you can hear it in their laugh, wicked laugh. Verse 14, the talk of men given to swearing makes one's hair stand on end. And their quarrels 
and their quarrels make a man stop his ears. Make, in other words, when you hear them fighting and disagreeing, you want to stop up your ears. The strife of the proud leads to bloodshed. Okay? And their abuse is grievous to hear. In other words, not when they're abused, but what they do to others is grievous to hear. Verse 16, whoever betrays secrets destroys confidence. In other words, somebody tells you something and says, don't say nothing to anybody else and you do that. That destroys confidence, not only in, with the one that you're betraying, but also with those you're betraying too. And he will never find, conge find a congenial friend, one that breaks promises. Verse 17, love your friend and keep faith with him. But if you betray his secrets, do not run after him. For as a man destroys his enemy, so you have destroyed the friendship of your neighbor. And as you allow a bird to escape from your hand, so you have let your neighbor go and will not catch him again. So if you've really offended somebody by, you know, defacing him, taking down his character, don't go after him because you're not going to be able to do that. Very few people is going to forgive you after that. Do not go after, okay, after him, for he is too far off and has escaped like a gazelle from a snare. For a wound may be bandaged and there is reconciliation after abuse. But whoever has betrayed secrets is without hope. Whoever winks his eye plans evil deeds. In other words, he said, looking at you like that, winking. And nobody's going to know, winking at you like that. And no one can keep him from them. In your presence, his mouth is all sweetness. And he admires your words. But later, he will twist your speech. And with your own words, he will give offense. I have hated many things, but none to, to be compared to him. Even Yahuwah will hate him. Whoever throws a stone straight up, and this is like a guy that betrays friends, if you throw a stone straight up in the air, it will. It, 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 whoever throws a stone straight up throws it at his own head. And that's the truth. If you shoot an arrow straight in the air, that's a good way to get kill yourself. And treacherous blow opens up wounds. He who digs a pit will fall into it. Proverbs. And he who sets a snare will be caught in it. If a man does evil, it will roll back upon him. And he will not know where it came from. Mockery and abuse issue from the proud man. But vengeance lies in wait for him like a lion. Whose vengeance is it? Yahuwah's vengeance. He will revenge. Verse 29. Those who rejoice in the fall of the godly or those that the righteous will be caught in a snare and pain will consume them before their death anger and anger and wrath those also are abominations the sinful man will possess them 28 he that takes vengeance will suffer vengeance from yahuwah and he who firmly establishes his sins, in other words, keeps repeating them over and over. That's how you firmly establish them. Forgive your neighbors and wrong and the wrong he has done. Even though he tells you that most won't do that. He said, forgive your neighbors when they've done you wrong. And then your sins will be pardoned when you pray. Does a man harbor anger against another? In other words, hold his anger for another? and yet seek for healing from Yahuwah? If you do, you're foolish because you're not going to receive it. You've got to forgive others. Does he have mercy toward a man like himself, and yet pray for his... For his does he have no mercy? I didn't read that correctly. This is talking about the man that doesn't forgive, that holds a grudge. Does he have no mercy towards a... a a man like himself, in other words, a sinful man like himself, and yet pray for his own sins? We know what our Messiah Yahushua said about that. If he himself 
being flesh, maintains anger or wrath, who will make exception or expectation for his sins? In other words, who's going to forgive him if he doesn't forgive others? Verse 6, remember the end of your life is coming. Remember, the end of your life is coming. And cease from enmity, division. Okay, enmity means to divide. Remember destruction and death and be true to the commandments or the right rulings or the Torah. That's what that's talking about, okay? Now, listen to what's said there. That's important. Remember, the end of your life, and I'm adding, is coming. And cease from enmity or division. Remember, destruction is coming at your death and death. And be true to the right rulings of the Most High. I added the end of the Most High. Remember the commandments or right rulings. And do not be angry with your neighbor. We know what, the two, what all the Torah adds up to. Loving Yahuwah with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. And our neighbor is ourself. And do not be angry with your neighbor. Remember the covenant of the Most High. And overlook ignorance. Okay? So if somebody doesn't know what you know, and what you could be wrong about too, ignore it. Okay? Overlook it. Move on. Don't pick at it. Refrain from strife. That's all I see on Facebook is arguments over foolishness. Things that they, don't, they themselves don't know is correct. Okay, but they're going to start a lot of strife with people. And you will lessen sins, lessen your sins if you do that. And the others, sins of others too. For a man given to anger will kindle strife. He'll heat it up, make it worse. Okay, and a sinful man will disturb friends and inject enmity or division among those who are at peace. And that's what's happening. I, I see that on Facebook all the time. I really want to get off Facebook. And, you know, it's not just Facebook's fault. It's everybody that's on there. That's all I see is that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm really getting tired of it. But I, I want to make sure that our, our, our videos are getting watched. So people are hearing the Word of God read. Or word of Elohim, verse 10. In proportion to the fuel for the fire... So will be the burning. Now, at the great white, great white, great white throne judgment, when that lake of fire begins, okay, it's how the size of it's going to going to uh, be uh, described or made possible by the number of individuals that passed into it. That's what. Listen closely. In proportion to the fuel, the fuel that. Gehenna fire in Revelation is going to be fueled by the, all those souls that are not that are going to be destroyed for the fire. So will be the burning, and in proportion to the obstinacy, or obstinacy, the obstinacy of strife. In other words, the more you abstain from strife, will be the burning. But the more strife, the more burning. In proportion to the strength of the man will be his anger, okay? Or his anger will be just put out there. And in proportion to his wealth, he will heighten his anger. In other words, you, the more, uh, okay, what, let me try to break that down a little bit. The larger the man, I, heard a, I, I used to hear the old saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. But in reality, they usually say the bigger they are, the harder they hit. <laughs> you know, so the larger the man, the more able he's able to dig, dish out strife. Okay? And when a rich man has power and control, he's able to do the same. And he's going to do it because he has the power to do so. That's what this is talking about. Listen to what it says. A hasty quarrel kindles fire. So when you get into an argument over foolishness, it's going to cause strife. Uh, there's all kinds of songs and things for that. I'm not going to try to quote one right now. And urgent strife, in other words, when you get mad quickly, urgent strife sheds blood. Yeah. And then that's why everybody running around with a 45 on their hip makes no sense to me. Okay? Because you get angry with somebody, uh, urgent anger brings sheds blood. Okay? If you blow on a spark, 
In other words, if someone has a little bit of anger and you call, you jump on them, that anger is going to get bigger. Just like when you get a little fire in a campfire and you just blow on it, it'll get, it'll fire it up. It will glow. But look, notice here. But if you spit on it or if you throw water on it, it's going to put it out. And both come out of your mouth. So you got a choice whether you can quench the fire, not spit on them either. Okay. But you can either quench the fire with your mouth or you can make it worse with your mouth. Okay? Verse 13. Curse the whisperer and deceiver because that's how a deceiver usually does whisper behind your back. Okay? Curse the whisperer and deceiver for he has destroyed many who were at peace. See, he started a rumor, most likely a lie, and it ended up causing problems. Verse 14, slander has shaken many. Slander is a false report, folks. And shattered them from the nation, from nation to nation. See, that's what causes wars and what? Rumors of wars. And destroys strong cities and overturned the houses of great men. Let's talk about their families. Verse 15, slander has driven away courageous women. In other words, and that's why the Torah has all kinds of things to make sure that you don't slander your women, okay? And deprive them of the fruit of their toil. Verse 16, whoever pays heed to slander, in other words, listens to a rumor, does it test a thing, test all things to see whether they're true or not, will not find rest, nor will he settle down in peace because he's always going to be blowing on the fire. Trying to make it get worse, okay? The blow of a whip rules, raises welts, okay? But a blow of the tongue crushes the bones. We all know Scripture supports that. Many have fallen by the edge of the sword, but not so many as have fallen because of the tongue, because of a false rumor usually. Happy is the man who is protected from it, who has been exposed to its anger? Who has not borne its yoke? Not about everybody's had false slander at one time or another. I've had my share. I don't have to bring it up. And has not been bound with its fetters. For its yoke is a yoke of iron, and its fetters are fetters of bronze. Its death is an evil death. And, and, and Hades, oh, and this word Hades is talking about the grave, okay? And the grave is preferable to it. Okay? That word there is shehol. In, this Hades comes from the Greek. And that's equal to the Hebrew shehol, which means grave. And the grave is preferable to it. It will not be master over the godly. In other words, if you keep his commandments, it's not going to be ruler over you. And they will not be burned in its flame. This is all duality in its speaking. It's talking about the lake of fire ultimately. Those who forsake Yahuwah will fall into its power. It will burn among them and will not be put out. That's where the lake of fire, Gehenna fire is going to be. It will be sent out against them like a lion. Like a leopard, it will, ming it will mangle them so that your fence in your property with thorns, so that you you fence in your property with thorns. That attitude. Lock up your silver and gold. Make balances and scales for your words, and make a door and bolt for your mouth. In other words, don't be putting out the false accusations or rumors. Make a bolt for your mouth and lock it up. Beware, lest you err with your tongue. In other words, you say something that's not so. And it's like you share something on Facebook. You didn't even bother to check out to see if it was true, but you like what it said. Let's put it up. Let everybody get all fired up and angry. Let's do it. I like to blow on that spark. Remember what you're doing. Least you fall before him who lies in wait. Who lies in wait? That's a great white throne judgment. Who's lying in wait? Yahuwah. That's who's waiting in store. Vengeance is mine, saith Yahuwah. And he that strengthens him with his hand keeps the commandments. He that strengthens Yahuwah, 
He that strengthens Yahuwah with his hand keeps the commandments or the right rulings. Verse 2, lend to your neighbor in the time of his need. We know Leviticus and every place else tells us if your neighbor is in need, lend it to him. And don't be worried about Jubilee coming up because his debts are going to be forgiven him. And in turn, repay your neighbor promptly if you're able. Confirm your word, word and keep faith with him. And on every occasion you will find what you need. Many persons regard a loan as a windfall. In other words, they're going to get it and they're never going to pay it back. And ha ha, I got the best of him. And cause trouble to those who help them. A man will kiss another's hand until he gets a loan. And will lower his voice in speaking of his neighbor's money. But at the time of repayment, he will delay and will, put, will pay in words of unconcern and will find fault with the time. If the lender expects pleasure, I, I'm sorry, if the lender exerts pleasure, he will hardly get back half and will regard that as a windfall. In other words, the unrighteous man. If he does not, the borrower has robbed him of his money and he has needlessly made him his enemy one that loaned him the money. And he will repay with him with curses and reproaches. And instead of glory, will repay him with dishonor. Now, we shouldn't do that. We should forgive our neighbors when they do that. When I loan somebody money, I look at it that way. So I don't hate them like this. Because of such wickedness, therefore, many have refused to lend. And that's against Scripture. Okay? They have been afraid to, of being defrauded needlessly because they've been, probably been defrauded needlessly. And do not make him wait for your alms or your gifts. Verse 9, help a poor, in other words, if a poor man needs help, you got to help him, don't make him wait. Verse 9, help a poor man for the commandment's sake. Go back to Leviticus, it'll tell you that's the commandment. And because of his needs, also in Deuteronomy, and because of his need, do not send him away empty. Messiah quotes that. Lose your silver for the sake of a brother or a friend, and do not let it rust under a stone and be lost. In other words, don't hang on to hoard your money up. Make sure you do the right thing. Lay up your treasure according to the commandments of the Most High. To the Torah, that's what it's talking about. And it will profit you more than gold. Store up your almsgiving in your treasury, and it will rescue you from all affliction. More than a mighty shield and more than a heavy spear, it will fight on your behalf against your enemies. A good man will be a guarantee for his neighbor, a surety. But a man who has lost his sense of shame will fail him. Do not forget all the kindness of your surety or your neighbor or your guarantee. For he has given his life for you. A sinner will overthrow the prosperity of his surety or his guarantee. And one who does not feel grateful will abandon his rescuer. Being surety has ruined many men who were purposes, purpose, 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 <laughs> and has shaken them like a wave of the sea. Prosperity. Prosperity. Thank you, brother. Pro being sh a surety has ruined many men who were prosperous, okay, and has shaken them like a wave of the sea, okay? It has driven men of power into exile, and they have wandered among the foreign nations. The sinner who has fallen into surety ship and pursues gain will fall unto lawsuits. Assist your neighbor according to your ability, but take heed to yourself lest you fall. In other words, pay attention to how this guy acts. 21, the essentials of life are water and bread. we got to remember that. It's not about all the stuff. It's food and water, and he's going to tell you, and clothing and a house or a roof over your head to cover one's nakedness. That's all i got to have. If i got that, I'm happy. Better is the life of a poor man under the shelter of his roof than a sumptuous food 
in another man's house. Be content with little or much. Sufficient is for the day. We know the scripture. 24. It is a miserable life to go from house to house. And where you are a stranger, you may not open your mouth. You will pay the host and provide drink without being thanked. And besides this, you will hear bitter words. Come here, stranger, prepare the table. And if you have anything at hand, let me have it to eat. That's talking about someone that doesn't you know, provide for their own. Verse 27, give place, strength, give place comma, stranger, to an honored person. In other words, a person that lives as a stranger. My brother has come to stay with me. I need my house. Okay, these things are hard to bear for a man who is, has feelings. So if you do that to someone that you're helping, you are definitely in the wrong. Scolding about lodging and the reproach of the money lender. Now we're, we're going to stop it right there. Okay, because we're right on an hour. We'll stop it. We'll start part five. Here next time. If you haven't yet subscribed to the Philadelphia Assemblies, please do so, okay? You just hit that subscribe button, and then if you like it, give it a thumbs up on YouTube, not on Facebook, on YouTube, and then share it to, to Facebook, okay? That'll show others you like it. And then hit that notification bell on the way out. May Yahuwah bless until we meet again.